Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, you are watching Off the Track, and it is time to drop the hammer. Well, everyone, welcome back to Off the Track, episode number 29, and I guess you could say this is uh, the second week of us shooting podcast in 2022. Man, it feels good. We just, uh, Ben and I love to talk, right? Oh, we do, and uh, this new form is awesome. Like we said in the very first one that came out, sitting here being relaxed and talking, it, like now that we've done three of them, right? Yeah, this is our third. This is like, uh, it, it's just so awesome. I feel like there's so much potential with this, and I already have some new ideas that I'm going to implement uh, in the next upcoming podcast for you. So okay. we're going to have a segment, everyone. I just thought of it. Okay, Bennett's got it all uh, uh, dialed in. This is going to be our first, I guess you could say, official guest episode with the audio only. And today we are going to be interviewing Caleb Montgomery. Caleb, a uh, West Coast 360 and 410 sprint car driver. Good friend of mine. Man, I, I knew we needed to get Caleb on from uh, the second I first started talking to him because he just has a good story. He's a personality in the sport. He and he just, uh, I, I think he has a lot of value to add because, you know, there's a a lot of um, other podcasts that interview, you know, top drivers and whatnot throughout the country. And those are awesome to hear. I think we like to hear the inside of what it's like at the, um, you know, the highest levels and forms of our sport. But one thing that's cool about interviewing local guys and people that, you know, everyone puts a lot of time and effort into the teams, but you just get to hear what it's really like in the dirt, in right. the dirt, in racing, you know, sometimes even just trying to make it to the track in the stories and what people have to do and a little bit more about their journey as they are kind of trying to climb up through the ranks and I feel like Caleb is one of those guys that has really started to you know come out and um, be one of the top guys on the west coast but it, it was a little bit of a journey to get there yeah I would have to agree you know uh, Caleb's Caleb's interview is going to be great because he he's just a character in itself as we've always seen on his you know whether it's a podium finish or whatnot but uh He's definitely one of the funniest guys you'll ever talk to in the pits once you get him to open up. Yeah, and uh, we told him our agreement, since like I said, we are close buddies. Uh, we told him, you win your first race of 2021. This is like eight months ago. This, yeah, is, this, this is, is a while ago. Yeah, this is probably March, April of last year. He said, when you win your first race of the year, we'll get you on the podcast because he was asking what he had to do to get on the show. And sure enough, like probably six, eight weeks later, he won that uh, SCCT show at Petaluma. We saw the excitement. We saw the emotion. And um, I think we were all just more than happy to see him succeed and then also pick up a couple more wins yep. um, throughout the rest of the year. So he's got big, big things to come in 2022. He talks about that. He talks about his journey and just kind of, you know, what it has looked like for the three car, you know, over the past 10 years of his racing career. So let's uh, jump into the interview. So joining us today here on uh, episode number 29 of Off the Track, he is a local 410 and 360 driver uh, from Templeton, California, and has wins in both winged and non-winged sprint cars. And actually where you guys might have known him from on my vlog side of things is one night he uh, lended me a set of shocks to run on the 18T. It's Caleb Montgomery. Caleb, thank you so much for joining us Welcome. on the show today. Thank you for having me. I mean, it, it's a big honor, especially to get the the tag 29. That's my uh, good buddy, Ryan Timmons number. Yeah. So this is going to be a great, great podcast, dude. Absolutely. So I think first we have to uh, jump in. We saw you uh, on social media a little bit at the Chili Bowl, Tulsa, Oklahoma. How was uh, how was that experience? Your first Was that your first time being at the Chili Bowl or was just your first time racing? So it was my first time racing, but I have been, I'm pretty sure three years prior. The first year I went was 2018, I believe. No, 2017, because I wasn't even 18 to be able to get into Osage. And I went with my buddy, Jason McDougall, when he ran the 73. And then I went the year following and I helped him out when he drove for uh, the Petrie, I believe. And then the uh, year following that, when he drove for FMR. And I uh, consistently helped at him throughout those three chili bowls and just had fun and kind of got to meet a lot of cool people that I never really gotten to, that I would have never really gotten to meet if I would have just stayed in my home in California. So, I mean, it was a good thing, I guess, then that you got to go there, you know, years before and, and kind of experience it before actually being on the stage. But uh, how did your midget deal come around this year? You know, you don't have a lot of midget experience. You always say, you know, a wing guy. Uh, how did your midget deal kind of come around to get to run some races and then, you know, eventually uh, get to run your first Chili Bowl? So uh, the people that I got hooked up with were the uh, the Woodlands. They actually have a museum down here in Pass Robles that's not too far from me. Their house is probably about a five-minute drive down on the main road past my house. But they have a museum down off of Jardine, which is about a 15-minute drive. 
And their driver, who uh, usually races their midget, which is Troy Rutherford, he's a local non-win guy in Ventura and in the USAC ranks, he uh, he broke his ankle, I'm pretty sure, and they needed a driver. So at first, Jimmy May hit me up, gave me all their contact information, and I proceeded to give him a phone call and ask him if they had a seat opening, which I, I knew inside of my head that their driver was in, a, in the best of shape to drive. So that kind of implanted my name into their heads. So one day me and Max were firing up the 410 when we first got it and the Woodlands came over and gave me or asked me if I would like to capitalize on the opportunity to, opportunity to go race a uh, turkey night in Ventura. And uh, I got to run that race, which was really good because I got three hot lap sessions the first day and then I got to do the racing, which I wasn't really good. I was like three spots out in the LCQ, but I beat Max Adams. That's all that we went there for. <laughs> Can you tell but, me on real quick? And then, uh, can you mention like who Max is for anybody listening that doesn't know who Max is in, in your in your racing program? So Max to me in my racing program is a uh, a little bit more than a crew chief. He's pretty much my best friend, and I've had a lot of crew chiefs in my day on my race team, but he's one that's kind of stuck around for the last two or three years because we're both dumb enough to pretty much try anything and anything that we think might work, we end up trying it, and if it doesn't work, we jot it down in our thick notebook and. If we do like it, then we continue to roll with it and see if we can build something off of it. So he's my crew chief, best friend. I mean, we do everything together. He stays at my house for about five months out of the year, just in the beginning of the season, and at the end of the season. So I'm, I'm his home away from home. I think uh, it's, it's cool because, you know, for the people that don't know me, Tanner, you know, Max, Caleb, and a bunch of our other buddies are all friends, you know, behind the scenes and the racing scene down here. You know, it's funny, you and Max, uh, you guys always come here, or well, when he comes over here, you guys always go to In-N-Out, and I know that's Tanner's favorite <laughs> food. Would you agree? Like, are you are you a huge In-N-Out fan? Uh, after spending a full week in the Oklahoma, I would definitely say In-N-Out is pretty high up on my tier list. It's definitely ranked higher than Whataburger and the McDonald's, but believe it or not, whenever me and Max are going to the races and he's here in California, we stop at In-N-Out literally on the way to the racetrack and on the way home from the racetrack. Just like in and out is a steady course meal here <laughs> in the three pit. Uh, th- that's that's good to hear. Uh, good to hear. We're on the same page. So you know you get this opportunity to run a midget. Kind of for your many years of, of wing experience. You know what did you notice? You know getting into the seat and running like how they felt. You have you obviously came from the micro ranks, which we'll touch on uh, a little bit later in the show. But what did it feel like getting in a midget? You know and how they drove and from everything you've watched before. Uh, very finicky. I mean, I remember jumping up from the micros to the wing sprint car and I drove wing and non-wing micros throughout my whole entire career. But when I got into the wing sprint car, I remember vividly the car leaning left and leaning up on the right rear, especially coming off of exit. But when I got in the midget, it, it felt like nothing I've ever driven before. I've driven the 410 non-wing, 360 non-wing, and they just move a lot. And you're constantly being very careful on the gas and making sure you don't upset the car. But at in the same manner and at the same time you have to be up on the gas you have to keep the thing up in the rpm so they're very different and they're honestly not a whole lot translates into the midget realm of racing coming from wing sprint cars and non-wing sprint cars which was kind of hard for me to grasp and it definitely took me a little while to get my feet wet and get comfortable in the seat so that since you've had the opportunity to drive all three um what one do you prefer now over the other Oh, I mean, that is a tough question because I do go back and forth some seasons between saying I'm going to never run a non-wing car again because they suck. And then sometimes I'll say, man, I wish I could run more than 10 non-wing shows a year. And I really want to run the big non-wing shows. But it honestly depends on the season and what time point you ask me. But usually my heart lies with the wing cars because that's what I started with. And that's what I've been so persistent with. And that's what I want to be good at at the end of the day is a wing car. That's really interesting to hear. And I feel like, you know, no matter how much fun midgets or non-wing cars are, you know, we're we're really seeing just in dirt racing in general, how many guys are trying to become wing racers, you know, mainly for, you know, how much more money is involved. But um, that's interesting to hear your take. So you make it through Turkey Night, now kind of, you know, heading to Tulsa and everything that took place over like the last week. I will say I was, you know, us, our whole friend group, I was, I was surprised actually with how, how much speed you had right out of the gate. Um, you know, we all did our chili bowl pools and and you were actually in a little bit of a higher group, but I didn't pick you. And all of a sudden, you know, coming out of the gate and, um, the speed you had in your heat race, do you just kind of want to talk about, you know, what it was like kind of being behind the wheel versus, you know, spectating, and then just kind of what your week ended up looking like uh, with your results. 
Uh, it was definitely a, a bit of a different week going there to not drink beer and turn two the whole day and yeah. actually putting on the race suit and walking down the ramp and looking at the racetrack. It was definitely a surreal moment. But when I got into the midget and I sat down and I got the Esslinger chop when you're idling, idling around on a super small track, uh, it, it was just a different environment. And I feel like I was getting ready and I was putting myself in the right man- mindset the whole week to go race and to go be good because – as we talked about in our group with all of our buddies, no one really, uh, no one thought I was going to do anything. So hey, I, it kind of motivated me to. I was going to say, I'd like to publicly state, I picked <laughs> you in my pool and you know, you started rolling and I was getting pumped. I was like, you know what? This is awesome. Cause I know they didn't pick him. So I'm about to get all these points right here and that's the way you got to do it. Well, but it, I did. And it was I one got of those you. things like I wanted, we all, we all wanted you to do good. Like, I think we all wanted us to, pr- you wanted you to prove us wrong, but we just like, you know, with how that works, you know, there's so many good guys. I it's have really screenshots. Hard. And it, and especially like, you know, I mean, as you can attest from being there and I think anybody from watching, there's just so much competition in that building and definitely guys with less experience. I feel like it, it'd be so tough on that stage to, you know, get up to speed, especially, uh, I mean, you, you were in a solid car, but there was definitely guys with obviously even way better equipment than yours that, um, you know, have more motor, have, you know, more everything. So it, uh, it definitely can be an uphill battle. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, not all that I expected it to be. Uh, I definitely wouldn't have been pissed if I went seventh to seventh in my heat race and just kind of stayed around in the back and didn't do much. But after that heat race with the seventh to third, I was like, Oh shit, we actually, we might be doing something tonight. And then, uh, we had to go ahead and drop the ball, of course, in the qualifier after making a little bit of contact and then being a little bit of a bottom bitch and messing up right there. But, you know, everyone does it, and someone had to be the uh, first flip on the night, and I just took the crown on that one. At least it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a nut, like, you didn't destroy do, the car, do you so know, I think that's good. Do you know what flip number you were? Oh, I bent the frame. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty okay. sure I was, like, flip number five or something pretty pretty shallow, but at least I didn't earn the, the green jacket that week. Jake Hagopian took the crown on that one, and we didn't have to worry about losing the most spots on the whole week. So yeah. at least I didn't get that, uh, get that going for my name. What, uh, what, what main event did that position you in when that night was all said and done at on Saturday? And what were your thoughts, you know, for the rest of the week thinking, you know, this is where I'm going to be starting. I'm going to be deep. What, what were you thinking? Uh, it definitely wasn't as much as a, uh, a hurdle to get over as it was for my preliminary night for getting my headspace Right. I, uh, the after the fifth place run in my B main on my prelim night, it stacked me up. I'm pretty sure like 17th in the E main or 15th. And right out of the gate, we went up to like ninth, but then the track, they watered the bottom right before I went out. So that's kind of a green light on the bottom and kind of shuts out the top. So I feel like my E main kind of got the short end of the stick on the uh, passing abilities. But I mean, everyone out there had the same track. So it's all just in the heat of the moment. And I got Waterburger right after my E main <laughs> with Max. So it was a, uh, it was a win-win. That's, that's cool. That's cool. And I, I feel like, yeah, that Saturday deal, like unless you're really far up front, you know, if, if you lock in obviously, or if you're in a B or maybe in the front of a C, but after that kind of everyone's all set in stone and in the track, uh, you know, like you mentioned, you kind of have to just catch it at the right time. If you even really want to have a shot at moving, uh, through some of the soup, because just with how many races they have to do, they, there's not a whole lot of time for track prep. So it just kind of goes the way that it goes. Uh, moving on to the next little segment we always like to do if we talk to people is, you know, where you got started into racing, your interest, kind of where that came from. Uh, so for Caleb Montgomery, what age did you start out at and kind of what did your first couple of years in the sport, you know, look like and how you got into it? So, uh, we're going to give a little bit of, uh, inside information here on the podcast today that not a whole lot of people know about me, but, uh, My first year when I very first got a junior sprint and from when I actually started racing are two different year points because at first I believe I was maybe seven or eight and I got my first junior sprint, but I was scared to death of the thing. I hated it. It scared me whenever my dad would start it up. So believe (laughs) it or not, my dad and grandpa would uh, hook up a tie strap to a quad and they would just pull me around with the junior sprint (laughs) and I didn't want it to start up. And then finally, about a year later after doing that and getting all the pedals good to me and everything was kosher inside to where I felt comfortable and I was ready to go actually make some laps. We went out to Lemoore and I think by the time I was eight, maybe almost nine, I finally got to do my very first race in a junior sprint, but this wasn't the junior sprints that we know today. It's not the Briggs and Stratton. It was the, uh, I can't remember. I believe it was a two stroke or something, but we, you actually had to, uh, my dad had to start it with a starter. It wasn't like the one, the junior sprints today where it's all, 
inside of the cockpit with a push of a button and a flip of a few switches. Wow. That's, that's interesting because I, I honestly don't know much about junior sprints. You know, we talk about where we came from. Yeah, we're, we're just, I we're, mean, you know, I mean, you guys know we're cart kids. So, yeah, like that's all a, a little bit uh, foreign to us. But from what I kind of heard you guys talk about in the past, you know, it seemed like you grew up in a really good area or a good area, but also era of, you know, micro sprint racing. Can you touch on, because like I said, everybody hears us talk about karting and the karting scene. So it's actually, I think the only other person we've really had on was Kyler Shaw, Mm -hmm. who was a little bit before you to really even kind of get a vibe of, you know, what it's like to come up through micro sprints and what that pathway, you know, looks like. So once you actually did get rolling and it sounds like comfortable and, you know, you wanted to start the car even up, uh, what, you know, what did that look like in the competition you faced, you know, in those years um, during that time? So uh, the one name that I did grow up with that uh, is pretty well known today is Giovanni Selzy, but uh, that's the one that everyone knows. But one person that I think definitely goes underlooked and isn't really a big name in the sport anymore is Donnie Lynn McKay. She was pretty badass growing up, and she was probably the one girl that I think could have made it in a sprint car, made it in the midgets. She was very phenomenal. I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on it, that she has two golden drillers, and she was a part of the uh, the Dunkirk camp, which they had... I want to say like six micros. They had both Vicenos, Dylan Black, Landon Hurst, Heath Dunkirken. And then there, I feel like there was one more. But back when I was growing up, I remember after my junior sprint features, we would all go up to the stands in Plaza Park and we would watch the B mains and the A mains for the supers. And those guys were just pounding the fence. I know everyone says, oh, back in my day, there was 50 micros. But like, I feel like we had quite a few B mains when I was watching growing up and it was pretty sporty to watch all those guys like Stan Yockey and Richard Vanderweerd, all the guys that are decent sprint car drivers now, or even don't do it anymore. Watching them grow up was definitely a big influence on my, my racing career. I mean, and back then too, would you say the micro scene, like there was, uh, I mean, I think my, micros in general, from what I've studied, heard from people, you know, they've definitely grown, but it seemed like back then, not only was there, you know, a lot of big names that went on to do things in the sport, sprint car racing and other forms, but also like there wasn't just maybe one track that was really good. There was actually like a lot of spread out competition and maybe uh, options and you could go places and, and race on good surfaces and et cetera. The list kind of goes on. Yeah. Growing up, uh, Lamore and Plaza were definitely the two hitter tracks. They were at Plaza raced on Fridays, Lamore raced on Saturdays. And then everyone from the Valley would usually go there and that would bring the big car counts. But as most people know today, Delta, that was not really a big of a track because that was before Bob Pinella owned it. And it really wasn't as nice it is as it is today. Bob Pinella has done wonders with that racetrack. And I hope, hopefully it doesn't go under because it's absolutely beautiful, but you could go up there and you could race Dixon and they had the same thing going for them. But whenever one weekend would close down and another one would stay open for like Lamore and Visalia, everyone would come down there or everyone would go up North. So it was honestly like a clash of the the North and the South whenever everyone would come together for the big races like the Budweiser National Shootout or you had the uh, the Kaiser Memorial up at Dixon. I don't know if that's the race, but – or we even had – back in my day, we had non-wing – strictly non-wing races at Dixon there was one and then at Plaza Park there was one where restricted, stock, outlaw, everyone took off their wings. There was not a single wing besides the junior sprints at those events. And it was a pretty cool, fun weekend, both of those events. You know, that, that's actually pretty interesting hearing about all those big shows that they had, you know, in the micro ranks. But I have another question uh, to go along with the micros. You know, me and Tanner both know from a T the evolution of the outlaw carts. And, you know, I'd agree they're probably more expensive nowadays just because how everything's evolved. Uh, do you remember back, like, would you say the micros may have been lacking some safety you know, features, because I know outlaw carts did. When I was a kid, I shouldn't have been in what I was. Uh, <laughs> would you say some some of the micro stuff back then was a little more sketchy than, you know, some of the top tier safety equipment there is now? I mean, I don't think there's anything that can get much safer than my dad snugging down my belt stupid tight so I couldn't breathe. But <laughs> I definitely do remember racing with a neck roll. And when I first got the Hans, I was like, holy shit, this is an eye opener. This is actually comfy. Like you can move around. Your head's not propped up six inches high. When you flip, you don't snap your neck. I, Oh, of course. But I don't think I ever took a flip with a neck roll. If I look back on it, I think my first flip was in a junior sprints my last year. And that was with the Hans. And ever since then, I've always had a Hans and I've never wanted to try anything else because that's just what I've been comfortable with. But I don't necessarily think that the, uh, 
the safety was subpar when I started, but I do remember Heath Dunkirken with the mayor suit that he had all six years of my micro career, and he still has it today, but he still runs the same Kirky with no nets, no nothing, wow. no guards. He's just he's just bare back in it being a man. Wow. <laughs> that that's uh that's that's cool to hear. Uh so I guess to can kind of continue on through the the timeline of your career, that was a little bit about your micro racing. Did you always know that, you know, the next step after micros was you, you know, wanted to be a sprint car driver? Because I feel like for a lot of us, you know, from a young age, because of so much, there's so much racing here along the West Coast in certain areas. Um, you know, I mean, you know, growing up, we're going to sprint car races as a kid to watch. So for you, did you always know that like, hey, sprint car racing is what I wanted to do? Or were you ended up, did you end up just kind of racing for a hobby? And it was just like, all right, we're just going to give this a shot. This might be the next step. We might like it. We might not. Um, kind of how did that go with you and your team and your family? Uh, I don't think I was on the normal path that most kids today find themselves on where they're in a junior sprint and they already know that they want to race a midget by the time they're 13. With me, when I was growing up, my final years in super and non-wing or outlaw, whatever you want to call it, that's politically correct. But my final year in 2015, we got a sprint car chassis and I was going to race 305s and I really didn't know much about sprint cars. I knew I wanted to race one, but I wasn't really as into it as I would say I am now or currently because I just didn't really know that much. My parents weren't sprint car drivers. I'm kind of a first generation. My dad raced a little bit of local non-wing in Santa Maria. So it was all kind of new to me. And then we bought Phil Deet stuff in 2016. We bought a full operation. So we got a trailer, we got a car, we got a motor, and we kind of just got our feet wet. And we didn't really know that I wanted to really do sprint car racing until I would say 2020 when I got hooked up with Max. That's when I kind of looked at this stuff more seriously and understood that if I actually applied myself and put in the time and put in the effort, I could possibly make something out of it and do good and prosper and win races. Because when I first started, I what I was doing wasn't working. I wasn't winning races. I wasn't climbing up the ladder, I was just getting more comfortable in the seat. And it really took some looking in the mirror for like 15 minutes for me to understand what I, uh, what I had in front of me and what I could actually do with it. So, you know, we always joke. So, you, so like you would say your first couple of years, you were like that, you were like a local smoky or something, just racing a couple of shows, you know, here and there and just seeing what happens, you would say. Oh dude, I was a hundred percent the local smoky back when I started sprint <laughs> cards, there was Hanford. There was the the fifteen Hanford shows, and that's about all that I did. I might venture out to Watsonville maybe once a, in a blue maybe a moon, Santa but Maria. I never really a Santa Maria. Yeah, Santa Maria. you know, a Santa Maria non wing because that's what I grew up watching my dad do was always non wing, and that's kind of why it spiked my interest just because I wanted to do something that my dad did and see if I could be better than him at it. So even but back I then, never. Oh, I was yeah, but like you said, I was pretty much a local smoky. I was just out there with old tires never really doing anything that the outlaws did didn't really groove tires never ground a single tire didn't really take into consideration anything or how anything could play into effect into my racing my race car i just always thought like oh the car was good or the car was poop or i was poop and nine times out of ten i just said i was poop would you did uh back then also did you just kind of you know you mentioned you didn't run as many shows as you do now but were you just like also running non-wing at the same time or were you mainly wing at the start at the start, I would say my first year or two, because I would be 2016 and 2017, I did strictly wing because for the longest time, my parents actually wouldn't let me do non-wing because it was the sprint car and they were like, hey, have you ever seen a non-wing sprint car flip? Yeah, no, you're not doing that. And then finally, like Max would be coming here for a Santa Maria race. So he'd stay at our house because he lived super far away and he would be going down to Santa Maria. And we just kind of talk about it at first and then Eventually, one day, Max wasn't racing a Santa Maria race, and I was I wanted to go do it. So we ended up just lighting the fire by doing that. I'm pretty sure in 2018 was when I finally had my first non-wing race. But I, even at that point, I was still just a local Smokey and a non-wing that would probably come out one time a year. For, for the people that don't know, I just want to give some clarification. Max is a big non-wing driver. He, uh, you know, he quotes that the day he took the wing off, he started becoming a race car driver. So... Just so everyone knows, Max actually races back in the Midwest for, with USAC and stuff like that. But uh, no, he's a big non-wing driver. And I also was curious, Caleb, when what did Max really show you? Or when you guys got together, you say that's when you start taking it serious. What what was it? What did Max do that made you you know think like that? Uh, at first it was so it was 2020, and it was around January. It was cold. We were just in the shop, and we I had all my stuff stripped down. 
and all my stuff was in buckets and all we were looking at was a frame and max had kind of learned how to square a race car differently so we we approached squaring the race car differently and we uh we got the race car built it was probably my first really kosher race car that i had built and a, finally a solid piece that i could sit in and have something good underneath me to go and click off some good laps and be consistent and starting off yeah squaring the race car appropriately and a little bit differently and then we started to take into consideration bars and believe it or not before 2020 i would just roll out tires and be like oh i got a 105 and a half and i got a 94 let that's the stagger i want throw it on there and it would probably be a four off right rear and a four off left rear <laughs> on a super slick track so max kind of opened up my eyes to rim size and the offsets on the tires and how it affects the car and stagger he kind of showed me a, a a new light into the sprint car world that i uh i quickly grasped and i i was hooked i wanted to learn more i wanted to understand how the cars work i want to understand how rebound and compression worked on shocks and ever since then if i ever have a question i'll just call him and bullshit for like 30 minutes and we'll talk about it and even though he's taught me literally everything i know about a race car we don't see eye to eye on everything and i think that's what makes us get more progress quicker than most people in uh in our camp because we combat each other and if i think something works a different way i i'm not scared to let them know and i'll yell at them <laughs> that that's awesome to hear i think uh i think that's a great thing for anyone listening you know that was a, a testament to like you know car setup is important you know depending on what you drive but no matter what like what you have under you and knowing what that is can be such a big tool Obviously, nowadays, there are a lot of people that can just get in and drive and stuff. But I think we've also seen like a good example of a top guy is like a Brad Sweet. You know, he knows exactly what he's got and what he needs to do to make the car better as well as, um, you know, the team and the people that you have around you uh, like what you had with Max. To uh, move on to our next thing we have here in the notes, I, I really think a fun year for you was 2021. You talked about 2020 was kind of when you started to take things more seriously. And if you want to use the word breakout year or whatever, uh, 2021 for you, you ran many different race cars, not just your own, the three car, uh, but you got in a lot of different equipment. You had to make some phone calls and you won a couple of races. And I believe how we said we would get you on the podcast is if you won, yep. when you won your first race during the year, we would get you on, which ended up being that SCCT show it, at Petaluma, correct? Yes. That was the first one. So can you, uh, I mean, briefly, you can talk about 2021, but mainly my or, or what I would like to hear is just you know what's it like driving so many different race cars you know I think for a lot of people they would say how that could be a nerve-wracking experience you know you never want to wreck anyone's equipment and, and that that obviously it's just tough and there could be added pressure you know depending on what the team you're driving for is like but you know how was that hopping from car to car throughout the season uh I can see how it benefited me and it also hurt me in a few aspects but where it definitely benefited my racing career is keeping myself in the right mental headspace to go and hop in all these different race cars, because I'm not one of those types of people that needs to get in the race car and the steering wheel needs to be 22 and a half inches from the center of my seat and the throttle pedal needs to have three inches of throw. I'm the kind of guy that just has the four bolts in my seat. And if it bolts up, we're ready to rip and I'll bring my steering wheel. And that's about all we need. But that is probably about the negative side of things that I don't necessarily really like that much, but you kind of put that in the back of your head and you just focus on racing and what the task at hand is. And I definitely think hopping in all these different race cars helps you definitely, I would say, be mentally stronger and have, be more confident in yourself. And that's where I think a lot of people lack in the sprint car world is you need 100% confidence in yourself. You need to be 100% confident that you can enter right rear above it no matter what race car you're in. And it's not going to wreck. But if you lift and you get scared, that's when bad things happen. And that's when you tip it over. Or that's when you spin it out. So you have to be driving in your confident zone and where you know you're fast. And driving other people's race cars definitely improved in that area for me. Yeah, I don't think you could be, you know, anywhere closer to correct than that. I mean, confidence, I always like to say, is, you know, over half the half the game that we play. And then, you know, you have your equipment and, you know, everything that you have to do during the week and all that kind of combines to give yourself the best shot at a victory. And speaking of a victory, I mentioned that SCCT show. Uh, maybe just quickly go over that that day and winning the race. I know where we were at. I think Bennett and we I... We were driving and back, we watched we, it on we were, flow. We were driving back from Ohio, correct? Yep. So we were... I mean, it's late. It's late, you know, because we're a couple hours ahead. We're in the back of the RV and we had just turned on flow and some good old Petalumas on and all of a sudden the three cars leading the feature. So what was that night like in kind of securing... what? 
I think you say that's your first real 360 victory, however you want to classify it. But uh, talk about that night and how special that was to you. Petaluma was definitely my first real win in a, in a 360 wing car. I've won some decent 360 non-wing races that I that I claim, but that that was definitely my first wing 360 win win. And it took me every bit of five years to to get that. But believe it or not, uh, going there, going to Petaluma, I had the confidence. I truly felt like I was going to win when I went there. I didn't really have an expectation to win because I don't really like to have expectations when I go to the racetrack, but I felt it when I went to Petaluma that day. Me and Max had a crazy far out setup that we literally were like, screw it, what's going to happen? Bike it up in the first corner and wad it up and go home? Like, who cares? Or either that or we win. So going there, I knew with my setup in my car, I felt stupid confident, and I knew I was honestly going to win. And I remember with, I want to say two laps to go or three laps to go, we had a yellow or a red, and I was just parked on in turn three. And I was just thinking to myself in the lead, I was like, hey, you just got to do what you know how to do. You know how to drive a race car. You literally did it for 27 laps. You can do three more. Who cares who's behind you? You're better than all of them. That's why you're leading. That's why you're here right now. And that's why they're not. They're chasing you. And when the green flag drops, it it's over from there. Because I know I'm confident in my abilities and I know that I know what I need to do. So, but when I finally did cross the checkered flag, that was, that was, I don't think I'll ever be able to describe that first win feeling. Well, I think that's kind of what makes Caleb Montgomery. Caleb Montgomery is the raw emotion. <clears throat> if anyone's ever been privileged enough to see you in a victory lane or a podium, you know, interview, the raw emotion you have. And I have a question for this. And I know a lot of people, you know, have seen this and kind of make fun of it, but I, I think it's awesome. You know, you're on top of the car screaming because you just won <laughs> and you spike the helmet down and the, and you toss the steering wheel. Was that, is that just pure motion or what, what was going on there? So the steering wheel spike, uh, actually backstory behind that. When I was growing up, I had the first D one. And when I was building the first D one, I spent a lot of time with Jake Hagopian and I watched him win a race and I saw him put the steering wheel above his head and they got a really cool picture. And that's always been kind of ingrained in my head. Like, Oh, that was a really cool victory lane celebration to get up on top of the car with a, with the steering wheel in your hand. So I kind of tucked that in my back pocket for whenever I'd win a race. But the helmet spike, that really wasn't planned, I would say. Uh, I got up on top of the wing, and I was just so pumped because I hate it whenever people get up on top of the race car and they just give a, a nice little clap or a pat on the back <laughs> or do a little, Err, you know, that's not cool. I go to the races to win, and whenever I win, I'm pumped. I've put in six years of time and effort into this stuff, and to finally see the results that I've been working so hard to achieve, uh, it it's a big weight off the chest and it just feels, it feels right. And I hate it whenever people don't get happy whenever they win, because they know exactly how much time and effort they put into this stuff too. So come on, be a little happy. I mean, show the fans what they want to see. They want to see someone behind. No one wants to see someone get out and touch the front wing and give a little clap. I, I agree. And I, I love it. Oh, I, I, I feel the exact same way. Yeah. When people win and they're not happy, it just like, to me, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it kills I, the whole race. You're yeah. like, I just watch this awesome race, and you you pull off this feat, and you're just like, eh, it's cool. Thank my team, and we're done. For like, sure, for sure. Uh, I think the only thing after that is you probably had to, you know, probably send that helmet back to get recertified after the spike. Uh, <laughs> but no, so that that was, I think, the the big moment where you know, I mean, an SCCT race, Petaluma, a good field of cars, and I mean, a, a dominating win, you could say. Uh, one thing I jumped over that I did also want uh, want you to kind of touch on because I think that there's a lot of value in this because you did talk about all the cars you ran. You know, how do you get those opportunities? You know, what's that maybe that phone call look like or what are you, you know, uh, obviously when you run good, you know, you have a lot better chance at, at getting in different people's cars. But, you know, how much effort and whatnot, because I know I've talked to you behind the scenes of, of what it really takes, you know, those those chances to just hop in 12 different race cars aren't just lying in front of you. You really have to go chase them. Yeah, you definitely got to put in the time and you got to make those connections and you got to definitely make the phone calls. But it's all kind of just a spur of the moment. Like you'll be bullshit with Dominic Selzy and He'll just be like, oh, you have you ever talked to homeboy? And you'll be like, no, what's his phone number? Give it to me right now, please. And then, bam, you got one phone number. Or you'll be talking to someone else, and they liked hanging out with you. They like talking to you. So at the end of the conversation, you just say, hey, can I get your phone number? I'll give you a call sometime. I'd love to chat at you. And then pretty much where, that's where the hard part comes in because that's when you actually got to call the person and create conversation because no one wants to just have a kid call them and be like, hey, can I drive your race car? Like, that's just not how it works. You got to – you got to call people. You got to establish a friendship. I mean, 
no one wants to go and have a, a punk drive for them that doesn't really care about them. I mean, and whenever I go to the races, I'm there for fun. Like one of the people I drove for this year was Dan Monhoff and absolutely a great time. Like that was by far one of my favorite car owners this year and probably in all the years I've ever had in racing and probably years to come in the future because we go there and we have a great time. We bullshit, we dismount tires, we have fun. We talk about the racetrack. It's not a very stressful situation. And I think that's what I'm really there for too, is to have a good time. And whenever you're there to have a good time, people talk about you and they say, Hey, it's a good time. And it just builds a good reputation for you. So it's more than just making the phone calls and talking to people on the phone. You gotta, you gotta have a relationship out there. You gotta, you gotta meet people. You gotta be nice, which I'm not going to lie. It's kind of hard for me because I'm definitely more of a, a shyer guy. If you don't know me, once you know me, you can't get me to shut up. I just start talking and I won't stop, but getting that, getting the envelope open for me is definitely hard because I'm more of a reserve type guy. But once I do that, I feel like it's, it's a little bit easier going. And then once you have a good relationship with someone, it's pretty easy to say like, Hey, let me drive your race car. What are they going to say? No, that's That's true. That's that's so true. I I think that's a great, like one oh one guide to literally, I mean, you just gotta, it's all about connections. That's so much about what the sport is and you know, who, you know, and, uh, you know, like you said, once you get your foot in the door, uh, a lot of people maybe don't realize not necessarily how easy it is, but you know, you have a solid shot and the worst they can just say is no. And you can just keep knocking on the door and seeing what happens. Uh, speaking of opportunities, I think the, the piece of news that came out, you know, as of recent was you now going to the X one this year, uh, and, and, you know, I'm assuming that was a similar deal as far as, you know, like you said, phone calls and connections, but how did that come about? And then also like, what do you think uh, this year is going to look like for you guys? If you're able to speak about possibly just a rough schedule idea of, you know, possibly where, you, where you'll be racing. A uh, rough idea of the schedule is a hundred percent Placerville. Well, hundred percent going for a Placerville championship, hundred percent going to be running for an SCC tam- championship. Hopefully you'll see me in the X one at a few Chico shows. Hopefully the, uh, earlier races and then the big races throughout the year at Chico, but wherever Tooch and Allen want to race, I'm, I'm down for it. They are my number one car next year and I'm looking forward to running with them because they're, they're just like Dan Monhoff. They are there for a fun time, but they're also there to win races and go win championships. And they're also a team that's been proven to win championship and proven to win races with people such as Andy Forsberg, Justin Sanders, and the list goes on and on. Even Mason Moore, they they're definitely capable of doing it. And even bigger than ever, I think they actually listen to me and they're about making me comfortable in the car and they're not really stuck in their ways. And like some people are like some people, they're like, Oh, this is the race car. And this is the way you're going to have to drive it. All right. They're definitely more about making me comfortable in the seat and trying to make me happier and be more confident in myself, which that was kind of one of my defining moments of when picking who I wanted to go with next year is I want to run a lot of races and I want to win a lot of races. And I want to be comfortable and I want to be with a group of guys that definitely fits me and fits my talkative and social butterflyness at the racetrack, but they're there to get stuff done and have fun. That's phenomenal to hear. And, and we are, uh, I mean, we'll be competing against you. We'll get the chance to watch a lot. Will the three car, will your own car possibly be out at any races, wing or non-wing, or you're thinking that might just be uh that might be in the Kayla Montgomery garage for 2022. Uh, at the moment we are looking at the first Hanford race because, uh, I don't think the X one will be ready to rip by then, but they'll definitely be ready by the uh, start of their season. So I think I'll be bringing out the three for the first 360 race at Hanford just to get my feet wet and get the season rolling and get some confidence back under me and get me understanding how a race car works again, because believe it or not, over the off season, people do get a little rusty for sure. But, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be running, uh, 410 wing a little bit in my own race car. I got a 410 car. I got a 410 motor now, thanks to Don Ott. And uh, hopefully on all the double day SCCT races, I'll be pulling up the three car to wherever the X1 is because there's a lot of SCCT and KWS double headers. So if I'm there with one car, might as well bring two and get twice as many laps. And then hopefully, uh, this is just uh, off the top of my head. This is something I've really liked to have uh, done over the last few seasons but hopefully i can get get in an oval nationals or some 410 non-wing races down at paris that's a that's been on my bucket list but currently we don't have a non-wing car because i tacoed the shit out of it at a at a kern but uh hopefully we'll get that thing rebuilt and it'll be uh it'll be better i was gonna say yeah that sounds like a packed schedule and those those double headers are great to see and uh, I hope we're there competing with you. Yeah, but, but that's up to Tanner. That's for sure. For sure. We are, we're putting together our schedule as well at the moment. Um, and, yeah, that's actually – we were supposed to get Caleb on 
literally the day after the Kern wreck, which was pretty bad, and you were able, you know, obviously recover. Um, our last question here, kind of uh, on the podcast, and I'm actually interested to hear this because I don't think I've ever spoke with you about it. But you know, what do you what do you want to like? What do you want your future to look like in the sport of racing? Are you trying to continue to race in California? Possibly, you know, a lot of guys obviously always want to go to the Midwest. You know, what what is your long term goals? You could say over the next five to ten years, or you know, what do you think that would look like? Uh, I wouldn't. I'm kind of open to anything uh, in the racing world, but in the same respect, I am a, I'm not very negative, but I am very real when it comes to racing. So I don't really see myself going to the Midwest or getting any opportunities out there because I don't have any connections out there. I don't really know anyone from out there, but hopefully one day we'll go out to an Indiana sprint week and we'll get a few connections out there and possibly make some phone calls. But in all honesty, I would be completely content running California for the rest of my life and the, uh, wing 360 and 410 ranks and also a little bit of non-wing here and there. But, uh, my heart definitely lies with my home car, my three car, because I do love working on the race car. I love doing all the maintenance. I love doing all the motor motor work. I love building wings. I, I just love doing it all. Even the, the stupid stuff at the end of the day that everyone's got to do, like washing the race car and washing the trailer and washing the tires. Uh, that definitely gets overlooked whenever you're running for someone else, when you don't really do anything and you go to the racetrack and you don't set any tire pressure, you don't roll out any stagger. It's not your guys. It's not the people that you grew up with racing that you have such a good connection with, but I definitely like driving for other people. And I like being in California, but I definitely do like driving my own car and that is where my heart lies. So maybe one day I would like to uh, have a big sponsor and, just have them pay for all my own stuff in my own race car. But for right now, I'm perfectly content running for other people and continuing to get laps and continuing to better myself at tracks where I feel like I don't have as much experience, like at Placerville or all the SCCT tracks. I feel like I need to get better there before I can uh, move on to bigger and better things. You know, I think you kind of answered my question there a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and ask, you know, you did graduate from college, which is pretty cool to be, you know, racing as much as you do and graduate school. So good job with that. But, you know, with staying home, if you have time, would you consider working another job? Like what, what would your career be if you didn't have racing? Obviously, you know, that's always our goal to be in racing and around racing. But if you didn't have that opportunity, uh, what do you think you would do? Well, uh, the last month, as you just noted, I did get my uh, my arts in a sociology. The study of people is what I uh, got a degree in. But uh, I got my bachelor's degree in the art of sociology, and I'm currently working towards a uh, an appraiser's license, which I'm working under a guy. His name's Tim, Ed- Tim Edwards, and he's an official appraiser. My mom sells houses. That's the company on the side of my uh, on the side of my personal race car, Luxton. But I'm working at to get my uh, appraisal de- license, and hopefully one day just be a full-time appraiser. Uh, everyone's got to have a, a fallback, a, a safety net, right. as I like to say, right? Cause racing doesn't really uh, work for everyone. And like I said, I'm not very, I'm not a negative guy, but I don't know if racing is going to be my cup of tea for my whole life. So I would like something to uh, initially fall back on, but I see myself working this job and making money and bettering my own race team as, as time goes on and just buying more parts. Now that there's a one more person collecting a check from yeah week to week. So, uh, having more money in the house never is a bad thing, especially whenever you have a race car. So there's going to be a little bit more spending, but I will have a full-time job and I do currently have a full-time job doing the appraisals. But, uh, yeah, I don't think I'll ever drop that job or unless I get an opportunity to leave and go back East, that's about the only thing that would, uh, make me quit my job, but I'm pretty content where I'm at with my, with my career path that I'm going down and my, my racing situation. I, don't think I could beat it. That's awesome, man. That is, uh, that's phenomenal to hear. Well, Caleb, that was, uh, that was a great interview. You killed it. We, uh, appreciate you coming on. And I mean, honestly, we're just, you know, four to six weeks away from the season really getting going and, you know, we'll see you on track. I'm sure. Oh, I, I think I did say it in the thing, you know, you guys saw it in the vlog. Thank you again for, you know, letting me use those shocks. You kind of, you really gave us some speed at the end of our season, but, um, just appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you, Tanner. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I rack in the views for this uh, YouTube video or this podcast. You know, I would love to be a reoccurring guest in the uh, YouTube sensation uh, series and maybe we can make something out of it because I, I know I give you a lot of ideas for content and hopefully we can continue to rally off. Maybe this. like a maybe like a partial like host here. I, and there. I think it would happen because, you know, 
we're running down south, you know, I think it'd be. I'd have to bring you on for, you know, maybe we'll have to interview other people with you. Yeah. How does that sound? Yeah, for sure. Maybe we could fit Max in there, you know, <laughs> do something a little spur of the moment, just a little, maybe a trailer talk session, you know, at like the, uh, at the trophy cup or a gold cup, maybe, maybe bring on nitro Nick or who knows what the possibilities oh, are. They're endless. We, we do. We do. Well, Caleb, we, uh, we appreciate it. Thank have you a great so rest much. of your night and uh, we'll talk soon, man. Yeah. All right. I'll see you on the iRacing racing in a few minutes. Well, I think that interview lived up to everyone's expectations. Bennett, I mean, what, uh, I mean, a lot stuck out to me, but was there anything yeah. in specific that, you know, stuck out to you? Well, what I think is kind of, you know, funny, but also the truth is when you hear him talk about getting pulled around in his race car like that, yeah. uh, you know, when I started racing, I only got maybe three laps in our yard in my cart, and then I was right to the track. But I think I was so young, like five, four to five, like I, I didn't know. I wasn't scared. I was just excited, and I remember just going fast. But, uh, you know, I think it's pretty interesting when he talks about being scared of the race car because that's the first time I've actually legitimately heard someone say, you know, you know, at a young age, they, they want nothing to do with it. But it's also interesting to hear, um, you know, those used to be two strokes or something like that. Yeah. And uh, they're different now. But, you know, Caleb's got a great story, and like we said, just a character and uh, I love his charisma and emotion, pure, just just pure and raw in the sport. Yeah, I think he's just so real, you yeah. know. I, and I, I think the sport needs as much of that as possible. You know, he specifically in the interview used those exact words. You know, I'm just a real person, yep. and I try. Not, I'm not trying to be negative, but just about you know many different things. You know, talking about his story, you know, and he's real. He he he'd be the first one to tell you like I did not take racing very seriously. Like I you yeah. know I didn't really know much. I didn't go out of my way to learn a lot. You know, I just kind of did whatever I had to do. Like we didn't do a lot of shop work. We just kind of raced and, you know, did, did our local, local smoky shows we yeah. called it. And, uh, and then he said, you know, he had to take, take a minute and just, you know, look at himself in the mirror is the, 15, the word, minutes. 15 minutes in the mirror is the word to use, but he, you know, had some great mentors that came along and, you know, really taught him the ropes. And then he figured, you know, Hey, if I really do put some, some time and effort, uh, I can progress with my own car. And then that led into other opportunities. And that's where I was most pumped to bring Caleb on as I felt like viewers, people always ask like, what can I do to get opportunities? What can I do to further myself in the sport? I mean, at the end of the day, it's just work. You have, you have to just put a lot of hard work in. You have to try to make connections. He talked a lot about, you know, hey, just talking to people at the racetracks, gathering phone numbers, contact lists, and, you know, trying to uh, meet as many people as you can. And that's huge. And then, you know, because of that, he got uh, a lot of chances to drive people's race cars. And now he's in a very solid ride, you know, going into 2022 in California. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to watching how he does in that ride this year. And you also hear him talk about how he really fell in love with the sport behind the scenes, which, you know, means in the shop. Like, you hear him talking about wanting to do everything in the shop, and, you know, I think there's some drivers out there that just want to drive the car, but I think that's why Caleb is the way he is because he's so passionate about doing it in the shop, and he actually really enjoys doing it as well. Yeah, and if you can get to that point, that's where I think you're really going to, you know, see success because if you know every every part of your operation, you're only going to be better. You know, I know some guys don't, some guys do. And we, you know, there's some people that don't that are still super successful. You, you absolutely can, but you know, Caleb running his own show, trying to put the right people in place. And you know, you, he, you heard him talk about his friend Max and how uh, a big deal it was that he got hooked up with him and everything he helped Caleb with. And I think that's just uh, that's just good old fashioned dirt track racing. It and is. like I said, we're going to see what Caleb has to do. We're going to race with him a little bit this next year when we're down in uh, California and man, uh, just just a great interview. Yep. So uh, thank you guys so much for listening and make sure you guys tune in every single Wednesday for another episode of off the track. Let us know who you want to see on uh, next as a guest. And man, we're going to have a lot more uh, fun stuff as we get into these early months of uh, 2022. See you guys all in the next one. See ya. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, you are watching Off the Track, and it is time to drop the hammer.